This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Susie Guerin. Now what? With Dow 17,000 in the rearview mirror, one longtime market watcher says there's very little that can prevent stocks from going even higher. Summer stock sale. How and where bargain hunters are finding value now, even at these lofty levels. And missing the bullseye? Three things retirement savers need to know about those popular target date funds that most don't. We have all that and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Monday, July 7th. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thursday came the fireworks. Today, it was the fizzle that followed last week's sizzle. Stocks sold off mildly after last week's pre-4th of July parade to record highs. Yes, the Dow did stay above 17,000 for a second day, and the S&P did remain just a day or two's rally from the 2,000 mark. But this sunny summer day on Wall Street was one for reflection and maybe taking some chips off the board. The Dow lost 44 points to finish at 17,024. The Nasdaq was down 34, its biggest one-day drop in a month. And the S&P 500 uh, slid 7, or about four-tenths of a percent. Some now question whether the major averages are just too high and whether today's modest declines could be the start of a pullback that many bearish market watchers have been expecting. Even Nobel Prize winning economist jo Joseph Stiglitz expressed discomfort with current sky high stock levels. These very strong stock market prices uh, are, uh, a are, are, in a sense, a symptom of the weak economy, not a symptom that we're about to have a strong recovery to our real economy. Stiglitz also pointed to the nation's growing income inequality as another reason for a weak economic recovery. Well, Byron Wien sees things differently, and he says that the U.S. economy, as well as economies all around the world, are doing well, and that's why he's very bullish on stocks right now. He's vice chairman with Blackstone Advisory Partners. Mr. Wien, so nice to have you on the program. Again, Always it's been a while be since we've talked to you. So, you know, so many people came back to work today with second thoughts about investing in stocks, but you're very bullish, and you also say stocks are very cheap right now. Tell us your thinking. Well, I don't think I, I said they're cheap. I think they're fairly valued and can go higher. Uh, the market is um, selling at a reasonable multiple, a little bit above the long-term median. Uh, earnings estimates are $115 for the S&P 500, which is the index I watch. And they, I think earnings could uh, go, at, go to 20 times, or uh, the multiple could go to, to okay. 20, and that would put the market at 2300 so I think we could reach that sometime this year or early next year. The first half of the year, Byron, has been pleasant but not blockbuster. Do you think the second half is going to be better? I do, but the first half, Tyler, wasn't bad. No. I mean, for all for, for a negative 2.9 percent first quarter to have the first half up 7 percent on the S&P 500, and I think we can do better than that. That would be 15 percent for the year. Uh, that would be terrific after a 16% a a year and a 29% year. Mm -hmm. So, Byron, I, I found that your asset allocation is very intriguing. Um, you said that 45 percent, I'm going to go through this real quickly, but 45 percent uh, long equities in the U.S. and non-U.S., 30 percent in alternatives like uh, hedge funds, private equity, things like that. You have some in gold, some in agricultural commodities, and no treasuries, no traditional corporate bonds, but you are in some very high-yield debt. Tell us quickly what your thinking is here. Well, I think the equity market is reasonably priced and can go higher. I think the bond market is overpriced, especially quality bonds and treasuries. So I think yields are probably going to rise there, uh, and that would cause a loss in whatever assets you have in quality fixed income. And I think that uh, valuations are going to rise for equities. So I think you can make money in equities and lose money in bonds. And that's why I have a virtually all equity portfolio. You are a fearless predictor, Byron. Uh, every year you make your 10 predictions, and, and most of the time, seven or eight out of 10 come true. What would cause you now to change your rather rosy view of uh, the stock market? Okay, well, first of all, Tyler, you give me more credit than I deserve. It's usually only five or six of them that work out. They are surprises, not predictions. And uh, their events, I think, have a probability of happening, but they're not sure things. I think what would unsettle me 
is if the geopolitical framework that we're operating in uh, really heated up. I think Iraq is going to be divided into three parts. I think Iran is going to move away from its nuclear develop weapons development program. I don't think China is going to go to war in the South China Sea. I think Putin is going to be patient in Ukraine. And so, uh, you know, that's a pretty sanguine view of the f four major geopolitical events taking place around the world. If I were dead wrong about that, and one of them uh, mm -hmm. erupted into a major conflagration, uh, then I'd have to rethink my optimistic view. Mm -hmm. What about, um, it's very reassuring to hear that those global hotspots, you, you're not so worried about them. What about here in the U.S.? I mean, there are a lot of people who are very skeptical about the U.S. economy. We get some good data, we get some bad data or disappointing data. I mean, what's your view on the economy here? Well, I think the economy is doing well. Um, you know, almost every parameter I look at, I listen to Joe Stiglitz's comments, um, you know, but you have bank loans up, you have over $2 trillion dollars worth of deals announced. Both of those indicate business confidence. Uh, the purchasing manager indexes are, are headed higher. Consumer confidence is improving. Uh, vehicle sales are strong. I think capital expenditures are going to improve. So I see a whole panoply of economic indicators that suggest to me that uh, we're going to be headed toward 3 percent growth. I, I don't think that that's what we're going to have. I do agree with Joe that the inequality problem is a problem, is, is serious. I also think that median family income hasn't risen. Mm -hmm. uh, but I still think the U.S. economy mm -hmm. is going to do much better in the second half than it did in the first. Well, fascinating insights. Thank you so much, Byron. Always a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you for having me. Byron Wien, he's with the Blackstone Advisory Partners. Well, stock picking is always a hunt for value, but where can you find it with the market near record highs? Dominic Chu went sleuthing. Here's what he found. Hunting for discounts in the stock market for many investors comes down to one important measure, price to earnings or P.E. ratio. Simply put, it tells you how much you pay in stock price for every dollar of earnings that a company generates. Some sectors are getting even more attention than others as value plays if you look at price to earnings ratios. First of all, you look at the financial sector of the market and that's probably got the lowest price earnings multiple. And so quite frankly, if the uh, earnings turn out to be as good as a lot of analysts are expecting, then that's probably the cheapest. Financials have lagged the overall stock market and are a big part of the S&P 500. But is P.E. the best way to value a stock? In simple terms, is there a better way? No, p and &E is probably the best way. The p and &E multiple is the best way, but you always have to factor in growth. Among Hogan's top picks are stocks like Gulfport Energy and Bank Corp South. So you can't just look at a price to earnings ratio and make any kind of a judgment. You've got to put that number into context to see if investors are willing to pay higher prices for stock. Clearly, if the growth rate of earnings or the prospects for the growth rate of earnings for a company are very, very bright, then it justifies a, a high price earnings multiple. And when prospects for earnings are not particularly bright, then you probably have a price earnings multiple is very low. Earnings season kicks off this week and corporate profits and growth rates are going to be a huge focus for investors. That could help determine whether the market goes higher from here or takes a bit of a pause. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Dominic Chu. While investors debate where to put their money right now, some economists are debating whether job growth or economic growth is the more important number to keep an eye on. Steve Leisman explains. Call it the case of the mysterious growth. Job growth, that is. 1.2 million Americans found new jobs in the first half of 2014, one of the best showings for any six-month period since the recession ended. But what has economists scratching their heads is that the economy probably didn't grow at all. We know it shrank by about 3% in the first quarter, and it's estimated to have grown by 3% in the second quarter. Net growth, zero. How could so many jobs be created if there was no growth? The severe weather remains a prime suspect. Under this theory of the case, even though business was hurt by the heavy snows and cold weather, employers were confident enough in future business to add new staff. Another suspect, weak global economies. In the first quarter, a decline in exports was responsible for half of the economy's contraction. Some of that could have been weather-related, too, with the weather hobbling transportation. 
several economists on Wall Street think the upbeat jobs number is the more believable witness for the economy. They point to other clues, like Americans buying nearly 17 million cars in June, the most since 2006. Separate surveys on manufacturing and services have been strong, and the housing market in May showed clear signs of a bounce back all evidence in favor of the jobs report. In fact, the strong job growth has some thinking the Federal Reserve could hike rates sooner than the current consensus, which is mid next year. Either the jobs or the growth data could be revised in the future. That might whittle away the gap between the two. Or it could be the mystery remains unsolved, which won't trouble anyone too much as long as the case is decided in favor of strong job growth and not a shrinking economy. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Steve Leesman. Goldman Sachs' chief economist has revised his forecast of when interest rates will rise. Jan Hatzius said today he now expects the Fed to make its first rate hike in the third quarter of 2015. That's a six-month, fully six months sooner than his earlier forecast for the first quarter of 2016. The reason for the change is the recent good news in the job market that Steve just talked about, as well as improving inflation and financial conditions. Not everyone is a big fan of the Federal Reserve, and now some lawmakers are looking to reform the central bank, which is celebrating its 100-year anniversary. The Republican-run House Financial Services Committee will hold a hearing this Thursday on reforming the Fed, but not dis did not disclose any specific legislation on the agenda. And things may be getting a little bit tougher for banks. Regulators from the Swiss-based Basel Committee on Banking Supervision are considering new measures that would make it harder for lenders to understate the riskiness of their assets, including government bonds, and may require them to increase the amount of capital they have on hand by billions more dollars. Still ahead, target date funds. They're very popular, low maintenance, and easy to understand. But we'll tell you about some hidden risks that retirement savers need to know. That's next. There's nothing hindering the sale of recreational marijuana in the state of Washington. State regulators issued 24 licenses to retail shops throughout the state today, allowing them to begin legally selling pot for the first time ever on Tuesday morning. Well, from high times in Washington state to hard times in New Jersey, where an oversaturation of casinos in Atlantic City and in surrounding states has led to a dire outlook for the resort town. Morgan Brennan has more. Once the East Coast's gaming mecca, Atlantic City has fallen on hard times. Seen a lot of changes. I've, I've actually seen a lot less people come down here. By the end of summer, the seaside city could have 25% fewer casinos than it started the year with. As the Showboat Casino gets ready to close next month and the $2.4 billion mega resort Revel heads to auction in bankruptcy for the second time in two years. Five years ago, that monopoly ended. We didn't act quick enough to realize that we need to reinvent ourselves, that, that there needs to be a transition period from monopoly to having probably fewer casinos, but having a lot more venues and, and activities that give people a reason to come to Atlantic City. Atlantic City's main source of income, gaming revenue, has tumbled 45 percent since 2006, as states that once provided Atlantic City's gamblers now compete for them. Pennsylvania now claims the most casinos in the region, and new projects are slated or opening in others, like New York and Maryland. Experts say this is all part of a larger industry trend, casino saturation. In 1988, only two U.S. states actually allowed gambling. Today, 39, as local governments seek out new sources of revenue. That's created a glut of casinos, especially in traditional gaming communities, where the impact has even weighed on state coffers. But analysts say casino closures in Atlantic City might not be a bad thing. Atlantic City is a legacy market that just has, uh, you know, has, has too much supply relative to demand. Uh, some of the other markets that are newer, you know, are still ramping up. And there was at least some foresight as to um, not oversupplying uh, the market. So I think the, the brunt of the closures will be felt in Atlantic City. But as Atlantic City struggles to reinvent itself, some businesses are already thriving, like the Borgata Hotel Casino. Revenues here have been increasing this year, despite the overall industry's declines. 
As more competitors close, casinos like this only stand to gain. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Morgan Brennan in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Archer Daniels Midland announces its biggest acquisition ever, and that's where we begin tonight's market focus. The grain giant is paying $3 billion for wild flavors. This is the Swiss food ingredient maker. The move is an effort by ADM to protect itself from volatile crop prices and also to benefit from the new consumer appetite for natural foods. The deal still needs the okay from regulators, but it is expected to close by the end of the year. Shares of ADM rose 1.5% to 46.50. Another deal to tell you about, this one, Expedia is buying an Australian online travel company called Watif.com. It's a nearly $700 million deal for one of the largest online travel agencies in Australia, and it'll help Expedia expand its presence in the Asia-Pacific region. Despite that, though, Expedia shares lost more than 1.5% today to $80.85. And shares of biodelivery sciences got a lift after good news about one of its treatments. A new drug to treat for severe pain performed well in late-stage trial, taking it one step closer to market approval. So that resulted in another $10 million milestone payment from Endo International, which has a licensing agreement with the company for developing that drug. Shares popped almost 9 percent to $13 and change. Apple has nabbed the vice president of sales for the luxury watch brand Tag Heuer. This comes as many expect the tech company to launch an iWatch wearable technology device this fall. Shares uh, higher by 2% to $95.97 for Apple. A train derailment in Montana has damaged a shipment of Boeing's aircraft components, specifically fuselages. Boeing's production depends on a complex supply chain that delivers many parts just in time for assembly. It hasn't been determined yet if the incident will impact plane production for Boeing. Despite that, shares of the company were up slightly today to $129.09. Not such good news for shares of major airlines like United, Continental, American, Delta. They were down today, continuing a sell-off from last week. The Transportation Security Administration announced new security measures that would impact international flights coming into the United States. The new procedures include the requirement that some passengers power on their electronic devices before they board the plane to prove that they aren't explosive devices. Shares of Delta were off almost 4.5% to $36.90. American Airlines dropped more than 3.5%. $40.10 was the close there. United down 3% to 3862 Looks like cloud storage startup a Box Inc. is waiting for just the right time for its initial public stock offering. The online storage company filed paperwork to begin selling stock back in March, but then he put off the IPO when investors seemed to lose interest in tech stocks. But now, Box has raised $150 million in funding ahead of that IPO, thanks to some help from a private equity firm and a hedge fund. Box expects to go public by the end of this year, but not until after the summer, when trading usually picks up. Target date funds have become all the rage for retirement savers. They're like mutual funds, uh, but they make investments that get more conservative as they get closer to the so-called target date of an investor's retirement. Still, there are some risks to having your money in a target date fund. And here to talk about it, Tim Maurer, he joins us to uh, talk about target date funds. He's a personal finance director at BAM Alliance. Tim, good to have you back. My concern with the target date funds are two things. They're, they're very different. Some are more conservatively run than others. But the other one is that I think there's an implicit promise in there. When that fund says, I am a target 2030 fund, you want to retire in 2030, your money's going to be here. That's not true, is it? There's no question that is one of the biggest problems. There certainly is an implicit promise of sorts that seems to imply that that money's going to be there and as much money as you hope will be there when you need it, Tyler. We saw this in 2008 when across the board funds of all varieties suffered significant losses, especially in the equity side, but even in the fixed income side. That was the first glimpse that we got into how target date funds can fail investors. This is the type of investment that appears to be extremely simplistic, but there are complexities mm -hmm. to it that are important to understand. Mm -hmm. You say that there are uh, some other risks, three of them in particular. And let's go down the list for our viewers' sake. Um, and the first one is about the performance that is kind of obscure, hard to know, since these are fund of funds, exactly how well they perform. Talk to us about that. 
Sure, a target date fund, picture it as a wrapper around a basket of mutual funds that has a prescribed allocation. So it's, it's really a good deal of complexity that is under the cover of the target date fund. And if you haven't had the opportunity to rip that cover off and see what's inside, you might not know exactly what you're dealing with. Some fund families that have target date funds or offer target date funds, for example, might be very good large cap managers, but they might suffer in the small cap, the international, the fixed income. Mm -hmm. space, and you might not know exactly how each slice of that pie is performing. What about the fees in these funds, Tim? Is that something I need to be concerned about when I'm buying a fund of funds? Am I not only paying for the underlying fees of those funds that are the constituents of it, or, or what? I'm concerned about it, Tyler, especially considering that fees, expenses, and costs are one of the few factors that we really can control when dealing with market dynamics. It is true that many target date funds have above average expense ratios, and it makes perfect sense. Again, because they're fund of funds, there are different layers of expense ratios on top of one another. That key factor is very important. So both of these first two risks that we've discussed can be reduced pretty substantially if you're working with a more passively oriented target date fund setup. For example, Vanguard is obviously the most notable monster in the ring here. They do focus on having extremely low expense ratios and a more predictable index-based strategy. So both of these risks, mm -hmm. these first two that we've discussed, can be reduced. Mm -hmm. And the third one, and that you say that uh, people should be aware of, is the investment risk. I mean, some of these funds are a little more volatile, um, and if you don't have the appetite for that, you might not know about that, uh, you know, what, what are the things to watch for there? Now, personally, I think this is the biggest risk of the three. We're talking about individuals' risk tolerance here, and a target date fund presumes that the only factor that makes any difference in someone's tolerance for risk is the time horizon. And of course, we know there's a lot more than that. Tyler alluded to it in the intro. I personally think that investors' willingness to accept risk is the number one factor that is not taken into account, so it's very possible that that target date that is set in the future might actually create a prescription or a fund of funds that is either too aggressive or too conservative based on the individual's unique risk characteristics. Tim, always great to see you. Relocated from, I believe, Baltimore down to South Carolina. Good to have you back with Charleston, us, Charleston, South Carolina. Tim, Thank you. Tim Maurer with BAM Alliance. And coming up, box office bust. Why fewer people are going to the movies. Could it have anything to do with the movies? And what could turn a financial horror show in the right way for Hollywood? The world's second largest economy keeps getting stronger. Economic growth in China picked up in the just completed second quarter to around 7.5%, according to China's premier. But he also said the economy still faces some downward pressure, so Beijing plans on increasing stimulus measures to boost growth. And now to drones. The FAA is working on new rules to govern their commercial use. Right now, it's technically illegal to use drones for commercial purposes, but the small remote-controlled aircraft are being used more frequently now by real estate agents, filmmakers, farmers, and journalists, and the FAA is looking to ease regulations. Well, Tyler, you, don't, you didn't need a drone to see that there weren't many people lined up outside of theaters over the just-completed Fourth of July holiday weekend. So what happened, and what are people doing if they're not going to the movies? Julia Borston has the story. While summer sizzled, the July 4th box office fizzled, down 44% from the year-ago weekend, with no mega-hits on the scale of last year's blockbusters and tough comparisons. And the fact that the fireworks landed on a Friday didn't help. Transformers Age of Extinction topped the box office for the second consecutive week, though its $36 million gross declined substantially from the prior weekend. The movies that are in the marketplace have to be profoundly compelling to get people to move away from their, you know, their, their on-demand, the internet, all the different uh, services that allow people and potential moviegoers to get filmed entertainment 
on their devices at home and other places. So the bar has been raised incredibly high. The summer box office is down almost 20% compared to last year at this time, and total U.S. box office so far this year is down nearly 4%. Hollywood is struggling to get audiences to drive to theaters and pay higher ticket prices with the World Cup on TV and virtually limitless content available online and on demand. In fact, the average adult spends record time on entertainment other than going to the movies. Over five hours watching live TV and nearly three hours listening to the radio, according to Nielsen. I'm seeing more movies on demand, less movies in the theater. I've got Netflix and Amazon Prime and that covers pretty much everything. I've spent about 35 to $40 each time I go to the movies. It's ridiculous. But that doesn't mean Hollywood won't have a happy ending. There's hope for this weekend's Dawn of the Planet of the Apes from Fox and Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy opening August 1st. And overseas, Hollywood is on fire. The international box office is sort of the savior because no matter what films do in North America, everyone fixates on that. But then if you look at the bottom line, like for a film like Edge of Tomorrow, the Tom Cruise movie, it didn't open that big in North America, but overseas it was a massive hit. This is a global marketplace. And so far, Transformers 4 has grossed $35 million more in China than it has in the U.S. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Julia Borston in Los Angeles. Seen any good movies lately? I did see a good movie. I saw The Chef over the weekend. I still like going to movies. Great to have you back. Nice. It's nice to be back. Two weeks of lovely vacation in Conca de Marina, Italy. It was beautiful. It looks like we can tell from your oh. suntan, too. And you're relaxed, <laughs> <laughs> at least for now. Uh. Welcome back. We missed you. That's Nightly Business Report for tonight. I'm Susie Garrett. Thanks so much for joining us. And I'm Tyler Matheson, back from vacation. Have a great <laughs> evening, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow if I come back. <laughs>